two interesting graphs to share with you today. This is Real Estate Money and Marriage. I'm Darren. I'm Catherine. All right, Catherine, I have two graphs for you. The first one we're going to look at, it's called the value of U.S. single family housing market. I'm not sure why it's actually considered that, but we'll have the graph up on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening, you'll just have to go with us. So here is the graph. By the way, a little context, Catherine. How long have you been in real estate for? 14 years. All right. So what year? 2008. Sorry about that. 2008, 1997 for me. So the graph does not look like it goes back to 1997 on this. You consider this 1997? Yeah, I do. Let me see. This is... Because I see 2000 and then I see... One, two, three, three four two, little one. Yeah. dots before that. So 2099, 98, 97. So right there. Okay. So that's 97. So this is your whole career right here. This is my whole career. When you put it like that, it looks, it probably looks like my career. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the biggest thing that I look at this is, I don't know why they call this a single family value of. What I see here, this is really about equity and debt. This is Fannie and Freddie Mae. This comes from the Wall Street Journal. So this is single family data. This includes one to four family homes with mortgages. So these are all considered single family homes. Up to a fourplex is considered single family. Anything above that is commercial. And this is home equity calculated from the value of the house. Okay. So the first thing that I really want to look at is we've had three recessions during this time. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Funny how, are they saying there was a recession in 2020 that lasted like no time at all? Yeah. And no recession since then? Okay. So yeah, we've had three. The longest one being the most famous one, which was in 08. Yeah. So we had a recession right after 9-11. And then we had the big recession in 08. And then right as COVID started, we had a recession that I think a lot of people didn't know about. What I did forgot about it. Maybe it was just like March 2020, March and April when people were really worried about money and not spending money and stuff was shut down. So like it was technically a recession, but it was like a because the government forced everything to close. So recession, we've thrown out what the definition of a recession really is. So that was a recession, but we haven't had one since, even though we've had more quarters of down markets than that. But that's besides the point. So I just wanted to point out, since 1996, this graph goes back to, we've had three recessions, two smaller ones, one big one. This shows the housing bubble. So equity is the green line. We got up to 15 trillion in equity, but we also had about 10 trillion in debt. Now, I just want to take a step back. Because we were talking to some friends who did not own a home during this time period. We're trying to explain to them what happened. What's your take on what happened? Because you came into real estate right at the peak of this. You picked the worst time to become a real estate agent. Yeah. Basically, in that housing bubble in 2005, 6, and 7, a lot of people were getting mortgages that really couldn't afford the mortgages. And then shortly after... It was like a perfect storm. A lot of bad things happened, one of which was there were a lot of layoffs. Another thing may have been that people had adjustable rate mortgages, and then the rate adjusted up slightly, and then they just could not afford their payments. So they stopped paying. There were a lot of foreclosures. There were a lot of short sales. But I think like the main thing is they just should have never gotten those mortgages to begin with, and they hardly put anything down. There were a lot of zero-down mortgages couple years went by and they had to sell and they didn't have any equity. So a lot of people were upside down. Yeah. So we have a second graph that we'll take a look at in a minute, but that's where we hear the term subprime. People did not have good credit. They did not have any money down. They were doing adjustable rate mortgages, which means that that was usually for about three years. They would go, I don't want to pay full rate mortgage. I want to do adjustable rate or They were even doing inflation. They were doing interest-only mortgages. So you only had to pay the interest for the first year or two, and then it would just and start paying principal. The idea was to let people get into a home, 
it appreciates and then they could refinance and get a 30 year mortgage or have some equity in the home. We know it didn't turn out that way. It was complete chaos. So we can see from this graph that equity, there's only about a $5 trillion gap. If you go back into the late nineties, you had what, maybe a $1 trillion gap. So it's not like people even had a lot of equity in their home in the late nineties. I think what is the run up here is that homes were appreciating so fast. Now, because I was in the real estate market, I remember what happened was this recession. The 2002 two, recession. Right after 9-11. Yeah. What happened is the stock market was crashing and people pulled their money out of Wall Street and started buying real estate with it. So that was a part of this. You had people that couldn't qualify for mortgages jumping into the market and then people taking their money off Wall Street and putting it into real estate because they thought it's safer there. Yeah. Okay. They were wrong. Yeah. Because then we went into a housing bubble and a crash. I guess that's also partially explains the housing bubble. Yeah. Another factor to that perfect storm is that people felt like it was safe and they felt like stocks were not safe. So then we had the Great Recession and then we see here in late 09, all the way through 2013, people were underwater as a whole. There was less equity in the home than there was debt. So debt was riding at about 10 trillion, but equity was down around eight to nine trillion. Yeah. Maybe it's called value of U.S. single family homes because the green probably should be value minus and then the red line is debt. Equity is just value minus debt. So, yeah. Okay. So then around 2013, things start to take off home values where people now have more equity than debt. Now, the reason why we're doing this episode, taking a long time to get to this point, is right now there is about $31 trillion of equity in homes in U.S. real estate with only about $13 trillion of debt. Yeah. So there's a big gap. Huge gap. And this is a good gap, depending on what side of the playing field you're on, I guess. When you look at the housing bubble, there was only about a $5 trillion difference. Right now, what's 31 from 13? Like 18? Almost close to 20. So like in 2005, 2006, 2007, like home values didn't have to go down very much for it to cause a big problem, for it to cause people to be upside down. For people to be upside down and then they, yeah, that's why we had short sales and foreclosures, blah, 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 blah. But when you have this much equity sitting in your property as a market, as a whole, home values would have to fall so much, so drastically, so quickly for a homeowner to be in trouble. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is that in 2019 through 2022, when the market was really taking off and going crazy and home values were just going up super fast, people were putting a lot down. So we're not just relying on home values going up for our equity. People are putting their own money into the house before even right at closing. So right away, they're moving into a house that has equity. So that might be a good time now to bring up the second graph, which is mortgage origination by credit score. This does not include like how much of a down payment. Maybe we can find those kind of numbers. But I think this is probably fairly equivalent. Would you say that the higher the credit score, the more likely the bigger the down payment's going to be? Yeah, I would say so. Okay. So what we're looking at on this graph is... Mortgage originations by credit score. If you go back into this 04, 05, 06, 07 range, right before the housing bubble, you can see that. No, before the crash. Before. So during the bubble, you're saying. This is before. I don't consider the housing bubble until like it started right here. See where it starts to drop off. So 07, 08. So right here. Oh, six, oh, seven, oh, eight. So right here is when I think you can tell, oh, credit got had to get tighter. Yeah. So it was really loose. 
Like the amount of bad credit people with low credit scores is equivalent to the amount of people with good credit scores getting mortgages. Yeah. So you can see like in 2009 or 10, that's when they really started to tighten up mortgage guidelines. They weren't doing subprime loans anymore. They weren't just taking your word for it. They were like needing a ton of documentation to give you a mortgage. So yeah, they're being a lot more conservative with the money that they would loan. And you can see that with a lot more green starting in about 2009. Now, what I think is interesting is you're right, that started in 2009, but it only got better. Yeah, it's gotten a little bit up and down since then, but it has not reached the 2005 levels of how much red and pink there was then and how little green. And yeah, if you look at the past couple of years, it's just been so competitive that sellers have gotten to be so picky. They're able to like figure out and choose the strongest buyers because they don't want to choose a buyer who has zero down and a 640 credit score. Not that they necessarily know that, but they can sniff out who's going to be the strongest buyer and the most likely to close with no issues. Yeah, last couple of years, it's just been the strongest of the buyers. I mean, I think it's interesting that you bring that up because I wouldn't have even thought that sellers are picking this. I just think this is lender status. Lenders are not, they're not dealing with 660 credit scores and under. Somehow the market got the message. If you have bad credit, don't try to get a mortgage. I think it's probably both. Like most listings we've had in the last couple of years that have gotten multiple offers. I know it really helps when Like I'm representing a seller and then the buyer's lender calls me just to vouch for how strong they are as buyers. They don't always disclose the credit score. In fact, I don't think they do. But they say things like they have really strong credit. They have cash and reserves. And that makes me feel good. And so that's something that I'll talk to the seller about. Okay, if we choose this offer, which is very similar to this other offer, this lender called just to vouch and just to reiterate that they're really strong and we won't have issues. Yeah. So I guess when I look at these two graphs together, if you're waiting for the market to crash, you want the real estate market to crash. Number one, you need it to crash so hard. Like the amount of mortgage debt now compared to when it did crash starting in 08, it's just slightly more debt. It's only a yeah. little bit more. Yeah, debt hasn't changed much. That's actually looks fairly consistent even in the last 20 years. Yeah, it's flat for the last 12, 13, 14 years. And it- equity is way up in the last, let's see, eight years. And I think that is both. It's both bigger down payments. So it's people paying into their house with their own money and it's appreciation. Yes. So I think if you look at these numbers and you're waiting for it to crash, Look, I've said this a bunch of times on our podcast and in different ways. I just don't understand. Why do you think you're going to be in a position to buy a home if real estate crashed into what you would quote unquote consider affordable? Because this would just be complete mayhem. I guess if you're saying crash, is that equity green line going down below debt? Yes. I mean, then we'd right? be like in a 2009 market again with short sales and maybe some foreclosures. But you're right. It would have to be such a bad crash that I think we have bigger problems. I guess that's what I'm saying. If you look at this in comparison to, if you don't remember what that, well, great, what they call the Great Recession was like, it was pretty bad. It felt bad. But look at how... People have three times, four times the amount of equity in their home as they did at that time. It would be catastrophic. I feel like it would be the end of the American economy if debt increased above equity like it did during that financial crisis in 07, 08, 09. Yep. I agree. That's it. Just agree? Yeah, you're right. Okay. So, because here's the other part of that equation then. When you line up the credit scores compared to the equity and debt, people's credit scores have just been getting better and better and better and better over the last decade of people buying homes. So you have more qualified home buyers. People have a credit score represents basically that you're responsible and capable of paying back your debt. So 
we've never on this graph, they've never been as high. The percentage of high credit worthy buyers has never been higher. People have more equity in their homes than ever before. I guess that's why if you're waiting for it to crash, I guess I would probably say you better have food storage before you worry about buying a home during a housing crash or a housing bubble. Yeah, I'll just add specifically about, so we know there's the two factors that contribute to so much equity right now. It's number one, down payments have been really big in the last few years. And number two, we've experienced a lot of appreciation. I would say if down payments were even half as big on average in 2005, six, seven, as they are now, I think that 08, 09, and 2010 would have looked a lot different because when you pay, when you save up a down payment and that's your own money you're putting into a house, it's much harder to walk away. So you're going to fight harder for it. You're going to pick up a second job, borrow money. You're going to do whatever you have to do. You cut back to keep that house. Because I think it would be really painful for, let's say there was that catastrophic crash and suddenly people are underwater. If they put down $100,000 or $150,000, they're not going to take that lightly and they're not going to walk away from it easily. And this signal is based upon credit score, based upon equity. These are responsible, serious homeowners. Where again, back in this, the early 2000s, mid 2000s, there was ninja loans, no income, no jobs, no assets. We were given mortgages to those people. Interest only 40 year. There's so many crazy programs coming out because not to get political here, but this started in the nineties of we want more people to be homeowners. So they really started to loosen the standards. And then that caused a financial crisis. And they're like, oh, maybe we need to tighten the standards. And boy, I think it shows on what happens when you tighten the standards. I think the standards should be pretty tight. Yeah. And so my big takeaway from this is if you're waiting for a market to crash, I think one, you're going to be waiting a long time. And number two, it's going to be so bad that you're not going to be able to buy. Yeah. And then which is one last thought is when you said home values would have to come down so much and so fast, you have to remember that every month that you make a payment, you owe a little bit less. So even if values started to come down and it took a year or two or three to hit the whatever the crazy bottom is, these people that have all the equity, they're going to owe less in, to, in the future than they do now. So the crash just would have to be like that much crazier and faster and, and worse considering like homeowners, once you're in, you've got momentum, you're paying it down. And so I guess that's another argument for just Stop overthinking the bottom and the top and what is the absolute best time to buy and when will the market crash? Maybe just get in and then just start paying it down every month just with your regular payment. All right. I don't have any other takeaways. That's all I got for this. Do you have any other takeaways looking at these two graphs? No, I feel like we pretty much covered it. Yeah, I guess my last takeaway is make sure you have a good credit score. Work on whatever that is. Your down payment... You probably can't compete with the other down payments if someone's already owned a home and they're selling and they're getting in. So I would say get in where you can fit in. That's 5%. If that's 3.5%, if that's 3%, if you can do a VA or USDA and do 0%, maybe you do that. Yeah. And it, I don't want it to sound like I was hating on zero down a few minutes ago. That just was such a common, popular thing to do in 05, 06, 07, and that did get us into some trouble. But hey, if you can qualify for a zero down payment and you can afford the payments and be responsible about it, then by all means, you should do it if that's what you have to do to get in or if that gets you in the market sooner. Just pick up off of that. Yeah, I don't think it was one thing or the other. It wasn't that it was a zero down. It was that it was low credit score zero down, not a lot of income, can't really afford the payment as it is. And then the market had a little hiccup and that caused complete chaos. As you look at the data, as you look at the reality of the numbers, that's not going to happen this time around. It just is not. And by the way, just if you are a first time buyer and you want to get in right now, yeah, it's going to be hard to compete with the 
buyers who already own now and will be selling because they will have large down payments. But you can compete in other ways. And also, I think it really is a first time buyer market right now because people who already own are not really eager to move because they want to hang on to their interest rate. Thanks for listening to the Real Estate Money and Marriage Podcast with Catherine and Darren. And when you're ready, here's four things that you can do right now. Number one, make sure you're subscribed to this show, whether you're watching or listening. If you're watching, you can also click the like button, click the thumbs up button. Number two, if you're a first time home buyer, get a free guide, seven costly mistakes home buyers make. Visit costlymistakeshomebuyersmake.com. Number three, if you're selling your home, get access to our Get Sell Ready Guide and Checklist. It'll show you how to get your home ready without spending a fortune or wasting your nights and weekends updating and remodeling your home. Visit GetSellReady.com. And number four, start a smart moves conversation with us. Get clarity about what to do next. Get your questions answered, your concerns taken care of, and an action plan customized to your timeline. You can schedule a call with us at SmartMovesCall.com or start a chat with us. Visit M.me slash group.